Okay, good afternoon. First of all, I want the community to know that the University of Guam stands firmly for the safety and security of all its students and staff. We recognize that safety and security is a prerequisite for learning and intellectual inquiry. We have procedures and policies in place which are based on local law, federal law, and commonly accepted practices in universities in the United States. We follow them and we attempt to be fair to all concerned and afford everyone due process. Governor Calvo's statement making a judgment about the case involving Dr. Ellert and his characterization of the university's treatment of the two women involved are incomplete and misinformed. The university was not given the opportunity to respond to his characterizations before he made them. And unfortunately, I have to do so in this manner. It is not often that the standing of the university and its leadership becomes a direct concern to the governor. In this particular case, it is the first time during my tenure as president, and I believe it is based on a one-sided, incomplete view of the facts and actions taken by the university. I have an outline of the events and actions taken by the university on this matter, which will be distributed to you. If you read through this, you will find that the university followed its procedures very carefully, and I made a determination of the nature of the adverse action based on the results of the investigation. During this time period, there was contact with the victims involved and an offer made to provide counseling services. On two later occasions after the completion of the adverse action, phone calls were made to the victims involved to again offer support and to see how they were doing. They were not ignored. The specific action against Dr. Ellert was made by me. Some may feel that it was too harsh or too easy, but I made the decision. Based on the information presented to me at the time, I made the call. He was suspended for three months, denied any opportunity to work in the intercession, denied a contract that he was trying to process, and removed from all formal processes and committee work of the university. He went on a pre-approved sabbatical for one semester. He has not been in the classroom or had any contact with students since November 10, 2014. The university did not stand up for the alleged predator, as stated by Governor Calvo. I made every effort to protect the UOG community. In the fall semester, I instituted a task force to propose revisions to the sexual harassment and consensual sex policies. This process continues, and we hope to present it to the Board of Regents for action in February. It is based on an exhaustive review of policies elsewhere, and the task force has student, faculty, administrator, outside legal expertise, and staff representatives on the five-member task force. Also in the fall semester, I executed a presidential directive requiring that everyone take sexual harassment training online who works at the university. There was 100% compliance. In December 2015, I inquired with the chief of police whether there was an ongoing investigation. He indicated there was, and I made the decision then to, to place Dr. Ellert on administrative leave and to have no contact with students upon his return pending the completion of this investigation. In January 2016, an indictment was issued against Dr. Ellert which contained information and allegations which were not in, uncovered in our own investigation. We recognize the supremacy of the criminal justice system in investigating crimes and consequently, we will await the decision of the courts and take further action as necessary. In the upcoming semester, we plan to conduct a sexual harassment climate survey using on-campus expertise to gauge the extent of the issue and perceptions. We intend to complete the revision of the sexual harassment consensual sex policy and conduct more professionally based training. In addition, we will be reorganizing our EEO office to include an additional staffer to deal with EEO issues, specifically with students and Title IX. This is a most serious matter before us. The matter concerning Dr. McNinch is of interest because he has made it so. 
but it is not an integral part of our activities. He wrote a statement to the UOG faculty on August 20th, 2015, that stated that he had been reporting, quote, criminal behavior, unquote, for the past 18 years. This and other statements he has made on a blog have been challenged for their veracity by another faculty member. As again is required by the university, I have begun an investigation into the veracity of the commentary that he made as a possible violation of UOG policy. This investigation has not been completed, and to be honest, it is simply not as critical as the other matters. In response, Dr. McNinch has filed a complaint with the EEOC in Hawaii claiming retaliation and discrimination on the basis of his sex. The university has responded to that complaint indicating that no retaliation has occurred. Nothing has happened and no discrimination is evident in the university's treatment of Dr. McNinch. He continues to teach, carry out his duties, gets paid, and apparently is able to make statements unimpeded by any action of the university. He claims that he is protected from retaliation because he is a whistleblower. The investigation of his statements is not about whistleblowing. He didn't blow the whistle on Dr. Ellert. This case has been discussed on campus and we were informed that there was a police complaint since November 2014. In this instance, Dr. McNinch is not being persecuted. He is being investigated to determine the veracity of claims he made in his public pronouncements. Truth is a requirement in order for balance to occur. In the statement of Governor Calvo, I fear that the absence of much of the information I have presented has created an imbalance in his public statement. Of course, I will continue to work with the governor and I look forward to the opportunity to personally present him with this information. Questions? Questions. Questions. Sure. Do you think it's um, unusual that the governor would um, come out in such a public way in an ongoing criminal investigation? I don't know whether it's unusual in a criminal investigation, but it is certainly unusual when it concerns the university, because this is the first time uh, during my presidency, and I don't, I wasn't, to be honest, I wasn't paying much attention to previous presidents, whether uh, governors have indicated and made an assessment and uh, characterization of the university in such a direct manner. Um, Dr. Underwood, uh, the, the governor's release of, of this address says uh, that he doesn't want, uh, quote, not let the way UOG has treated these cases keep victims from speaking up. His uh, address also says institutionalized silence should be criminal. Do you think that there is a, an institutionalized silence that is being um, implemented at the university that is uh, encouraging victims to remain silent? Uh, no, I don't know on what basis that might be. Uh, we have a very open process to submit EEO complaints and that these EEO complaints are dealt with in a very confidential manner by our EEO office. In terms of the general topic, of course, there's no institutionalized silence. Uh, there's been avid discussion about this topic on campus, I'm sure, in a variety of uh, areas. Um, if the one of the complaints against uh, Dr. Ron, or Ron McNinch was that he violated institution by suggesting, or institutional policy by suggesting that um, you know, people report crimes to folks having killed the chief prosecutor, something that Governor Calvo suggested in his letter. Um, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Because well, that's not the case at all. He's, uh, Dr. McNinch is not being investigated because he's asked people to report crimes to uh, uh, Phil Tadinko, he's being investigated for specifically saying that he has been reporting crimes for 18 years. And so the, one of his the staff members, one of his complaints against Dr. McNinch was that he was suggesting for people not to follow the institutional policy. No, that's not the case at all. That's not the case at all. That's an interpretation 
perhaps given by him. But in point of fact, the investigation has nothing to do with whether people should complain or should not complain. He made a statement that he has been submitting criminal complaints for 18 years. So the question arose in the minds of some faculty members, especially one, is that true or not? That's what's being investigated. Sir, um, just questions about how um, uh, Professor Ellis uh, could have been removed from campus sooner than when he was removed. Um, is, are you constrained by administrative union type procedures or is it something is there something you wanted to do that's more forceful that you can't do because it's under the rules this is the, ex the, more, the extent of what you can do no uh, that's not the case in fact we first heard about the complaint on November 3rd and then November 10th he was removed from the classroom and he hasn't been back since so November 10th of 2014 18. yeah so he may have made, uh, you know, I'm, I can't say for sure that he was uh, banned entirely. Maybe he made an appearance. But there's nothing in the rules that uh, doesn't allow us to take action to protect students. What is in the rules is that we have to go through a series of procedures, especially when we carry out an adverse action. So we have to give him his due process. That's what's clear that you have to do. So at what point would Well, we have to make that determination, you know, so that's open, that's an open situation. Of course, if he, if the, the, the court case was prosecuted quickly, that decision would come along much faster. However, I have to say that if it drags on, we'd have to reassess uh, our decision uh, based on the information that is in the indictment. Well, I think we, we've said it privately, and but you know, uh, also we want to say, you know, quite openly. Of course, we. Uh, I made a statement to the university community. I think on a couple of occasions already, including our faculty assembly, that we own this problem. That is our institutional responsibility to provide a safe and secure environment. I, we take that very seriously. And the, the, in fact, I made that statement so far reaching that some of our legal insurers have said, you're making too much, taking right. too much responsibility. But we take responsibility for the climate. So people should not in fact, just be in fact secure. They should feel secure because otherwise nothing happens. So, you know, of course we regret the incidents that occurred to these uh, uh, these two particular victims, and of course we will investigate each item as it comes to us. And so we have uh, a certain level of uh, trust and confidence in our, in our processes, uh, but we're not perfect. And so it's pretty obvious that in our investigation, maybe there were, you know, it was a, a long period of time between our initial investigation and maybe when the police picked it up. So, you know, that, that may account for the difference of information that we had and the information that was released in the indictment. Is there anything based on the investigation that happened that maybe in the event of another case like this that you could improve upon, that you think that you will improve upon? Well, as always, we, we, we say the civil authorities take primacy. So we're not detectives. If there's a crime and the police is on it, we trust them. And that's what we did in this instance. We never said that this is the end of it. We just assumed that if there was a real crime, the police were investigating it. That's what I, I wanted to confirm. And if the police are investigating it, then I want that to be completed. So sometimes people misunderstood when I said we own this problem as if to say that I want to conduct the, I'm, I'm not a detective. I don't have anybody here who works as a detective. And so I, I, we understand the primacy of that. We don't want to be involved in law enforcement. We just want to be involved in the processes that lead to those administrative violations, of which are numerous. Do Dr. Underwood, you 
mention a bunch of upcoming events and, and uh, policy changes that are being uh, considered a, a, as a result of this situation. I'm wondering if I could ask to, to follow up on the, the status of your a, any changes to your fraternization policies between professors and students? Well, that, that, that remains to be seen because that policy has not been finalized. Of course, you know, if you just, just, just thinking out loud, it's important to, to remember that the issue that we're talking about is not consensual sex. This was not con a matter of consensual sex. So, you know, the, to, to think that if we had a different policy on consensual sex, this would have been prevented, would have been, uh, would be, I think, going in the wrong direction. But the, the issue, of course, is in a university where the average age of a graduate student is 35 and the average age of an undergraduate student is 22, 23, you know, what are the, uh, what are the uh, rights of association of adults? And that's an, that's an, that's an open question. Of course, I can say with uh, probably not fear of contradiction that uh, what certainly at a minimum will emerge out of this uh, task force is that, uh, you know, that there will be again a renewed statement against uh, uh, consensual sexual relationships and a requirement that if you engage in any relationship uh, with a student that it be immediately disclosed and that failure to disclose it would itself be actionable. That's at a minimum. Uh, we, we don't know. There's some discussion in the task force to go further than that. Okay. Okay, thank you so much.